Freddie Valentine and the Soho Ghoul. As narrated by John Vernon. Music by Peter Diggins. Written, produced and directed by David Chaudois. Engineered by Ben Aitken at another studio in the depths of Soho. Episode 1. Bert Oneski was a Polish émigré who slipped under the Iron Curtain sometime in the late 1970s. Either that or he bent it open with his bare hands, greased himself up and squeezed through it. Such was the man's fearsome physique. He was rumoured to have punched Lech Wałęsa in a bar fight in Gdansk and had not found solidarity with Solidarity, the fledgling trade union that eventually restored Poland to a semblance of democracy. Neither did he enjoy favour with the communists when his love of fighting ensured a stint in a Russian-built gulag in the Carpathian Mountains. To be able to escape his transport to the fearsome jail, the cunning to survive and evade a week-long hunt in the depths of a Polish winter proved he was not only man enough, but to escape and to find his way to London without papers and still wearing his prison outfit with one leg manacle still attached showed an almost superhuman cunning and tenacity. On arrival, he instantly made a fearsome reputation on the bare-knuckle boxing scene, won and lost thousands, and was rumoured to have been the muscle on the Mayfair deposit box heist. The police believed the one-ton safe had been carried up a flight of steps to the getaway truck by a single man, and there was only one man in London strong enough. To see him today was almost as if one was watching a caged bear at a zoo. A gorilla in a tuxedo, a magnificent beast, now tamed. His fangs filed, his talons blunted, the fire in his eyes dimmed. The polished dome of his bald head, that magnificent walrus moustache, and those huge fists ensured that he would always attract attention wherever he went. And when chauffeuring Lord Freddy Valentine, the sideways glances and double takes only increased. Freddy Valentine, or Lord Freddy Valentine, as he was also known, was slight, where Oneski was broad, a mere English willow next to the Polish oak. So much was not known, guessed or gossiped about these two that it was hard to distinguish fact from barroom brag or whispered aside. Lord Freddy, Oneski's employer, was a mystery wrapped in an enigma, coated in a purple paisley veneer. A record producer, a nightclub crooner, the one-time manager of the heavy metal band Satan's Claw. The bastard son of an eccentric aristocrat, a dabbler in the dark arts, some or none of this might have been true. It was the year 2013, but the man dressed in a purple safari suit stack-heeled boots, and his hair was a matted bird's nest of the Jimi Hendrix experience variety. He spoke like an East End barrow boy, read trashy women's magazines, and kept a budgie called Grayson. Legend had it that whatever he had, the ladies couldn't resist it. What was true was that he left the decaying mansion residence less and less these days, at least during the day, that is, and this is where we find him being roused from his deep slumber on the circular bed in the habitable part of the east tower of the manor house at four in the afternoon. Good morning, Freddy. You are awake? From Bert, carrying a tray with an Italian espresso maker, a chipped Wedgwood bone china miniature teacup and a bag of sugar with a spoon handle protruding at the stained mouth. A few groans later and a thin hand emerged from under the covers and retrieved a pair of dark glasses. Fucking hell, Bert, alive, only just. Has the bird with the big knockers already left? No, Freddy, it was just a dream. There is no bird with the big knockers. Oh, thank fuck for that. There was another call from Inspector Chetvin. Ah? Oh, what did he want, then? I don't bloody know, Freddy. How the fuck should I know? I am not a bloody clairvoyant, am I? Freddy slipped out of bed, 
naked save the dark glasses, purple socks and leopard print thong. He slipped into a one-piece safari suit, jumped into a pair of Chelsea boots and was downing the black caffeine and sugar before you could say, Jesus, did you say a leopard skin thong? Well, why didn't you fucking ask him? You can fucking ask him yourself. He's in the drawing room. Episode 2 Detective Chetwin always had a furrowed brow. His eyes narrowed in a permanent state of suspicion. Not just what the police force had made him witness made him forever doubt the duplicitousness of humanity, but he didn't trust his wife or his teenage daughters, who had become increasingly disrespectful towards him. He didn't trust his wife because, however bad his daughter's misdemeanours, she would cover for them. He would arrive home, walking through the front gate and down the front path to his house, he would hear blazing rows, but when he unlocked the front door, there was an uneasy peace in the house. Worse than this, to top it all, he couldn't trust his own body. Since quitting smoking, it had gone into revolt and he had developed irritable bowel syndrome. Living the last five years with this nightmare condition, he never knew when he would need to go. And when he did have to go, he had about 45 seconds. Flying out of courtrooms for the magistrate's toilet, fleeing crime scenes for the cover of a bush, and bursting into people's houses with the flash of his badge were taking their toll on his nerves and exacerbating the condition known to be caused by stress. It was a vicious circle. Bert had a deep dislike for the police, or anybody in authority for that matter, but what he had seen of the Metropolitan Police during his time in the East End of London, he hadn't worried that he would come out of the cell alive. Poland had been different. There was no surety that once inside a cell, living and breathing, you would remain so. Lord Freddy, however, was terrified of them. He had dealings with them what seemed a lifetime ago and had almost fallen foul of them. More recently, in the 1960s, he'd been picked up by the notorious Soho Vice Squad, put in the Black Mariah and had suffered the indignities of the lubricated truncheon. After three days of abuse at the Beak Street Nick, they let him go with the charge of pandering. It had taken Lord Freddy years to overcome his very rational fear of the... Cunts in uniform. His fear of them had stoked a black ball of acid desire for revenge that even now would grip him, and he would daydream about tracking those bastards down one by one and executing them. He could see their faces in slow motion as they opened the front doors to their semi-detached houses in Surbiton the curiosity turning to wonder as they recognised the wild hair, purple caftan and feather boa. Then the slow, creeping dread as the pistol with the monstrous silencer was raised to the temple, the dull clunk of the hammer, the recoil, the clack of the shattering of the skull at the exit, the black and blue hole dripping. Freddy Valentine, Detective Chetwin ventured, the knees buckling, Good afternoon. The slow stride back to the Bentley. Hello. The screams from inside the house as the dead policeman was discovered faded away. Christ, he's a total space cadet, thought Chetwin, as he eyed the frozen man in the corner of the massive drawing room. He'd walked in and ground to a halt. Oh, if only I could see those eyes. I wonder if he really did fry his brain on acid in the 1960s. Sorry, Detective, I was remembering something I must get round to doing one day. 